Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the last session on the last day. Good for you. Uh, my name is John Dickinson, and I am the OpenStack Swift PTL, and I am also a, the director of technology at a company called SwiftStack. So I want to talk about this. I've wanted to give this talk for a lot of different summits, and this is now the time to do it. This is great. Uh, so the point of this talk is to answer a few questions and hopefully provide some answers that we can point people to later and, and uh, uh, resolve some outstanding uh, questions, potentially. Uh, so I want to talk about what Swift is, what Swift is not. I want to talk about where Swift is extensible, how people are using this, and then kind of what the future holds. So to start with, I want to start, I want to, I want to talk about what Swift is not. Swift is not a product. Swift is a storage engine, which means that if you need a product, if you need, there's lots of other pieces that go into a product that are not developed as part of Swift itself. You've got to deal with things like billing. You've got to deal with things like uh, integration and, and you've got to deal with user identities. Those are kind of some of the big things. You've got to, you've got to deal with kind of the operational putting it together and making it, making it a whole system. Swift, Swift well, I'm, I'm going to tell you what it is in just a second. It's not a product, though. It is also not, absolutely not, a provisioning layer for other storage systems. You do not go ask Swift, give me an object storage cluster. That's not what you do. It is also not a file system, nor is it directly mountable. So you, don't, you, don't, you do not have a Swift cluster and then mount it on, directly on your Nova instance or your, your bare metal server someplace. So if that's the case, then what, what, what is Swift? What, what would you say you do here? Swift is an object storage engine. And it is an implementation of an object storage engine. It is responsible for durably storing and maintaining the durability and availability of your data and supporting massive concurrency across that. It's built for scale, very large, thousands, tens of thousands of hard drives, petabytes of data. Uh, it, is, it is optimized for durability, availability, and concurrency across the entire data set. Just a little bit of an overview of how Swift works how we do that, the pieces of Swift, which is going to come in as very important when we talk about the different areas where Swift is extensible. Start with users. We always need to start with the users. Users talk to a proxy server. The proxy server is responsible for implementing most of the API and coordinating all the discussion with the storage nodes. The storage nodes are responsible for persisting the data to disk, and they provide a little bit of the API, but uh, that's, that's, where you're, that's the basic idea there. And the really great thing about this is that these two components, the proxy servers and the storage nodes, are stateless. They're independent. There's no, no single point of failure there, which means that you can, if you need more, you can add more. Uh, you can add in different proxy servers. You can add in different storage servers. And oftentimes, what you'll see is that you'll put the proxy servers behind a load balancer um, so you have just a single endpoint that you talk to. Uh, and that works. that works pretty well. So. That should give you, on its own right there, looking at the client talking to a proxy server, proxy servers talking to storage servers, um, and we'll get a little more detailed in a second, but that, that should give you a very good idea of where the extensibility points might be. So there's two major pieces, kind of like two pairs that go together, a nice harmonious melody. We've got extensibility in middleware, and I'll need to talk about that in a little uh, de definition a little bit. In the storage world, I've learned. I'm, I'm very new to the storage world in the, in the big scheme of things. And uh, there's, there's a common industry phrase of talking about middleware, generally you know, things your, your data is flowing through and stuff like that. Swift middleware is uh, a little more um, specific to Swift's implementation. And I'll cover how that works in a little bit. The other major piece, in addition, so we've got middleware. And the other piece where Swift is extensible is with storage volumes. Those are the kind of things I want to I highlight and go into some depth on today. So together, with those things, you get a really powerful e extensibility that uh, allows you to um, 
I mean, they complement one another. You can you can do one, some things with one and some things with another, and together, uh, you can you can use what you need. It's it's the whole idea that we've got with the, the modular Swift design that says that you know, add more where you need it, and if you need more functionality here, well, maybe that's implemented in one way, and you don't have to worry about the other way, and and so on and so forth. So let's talk about those middleware first. What is middleware? That's a big pipeline going through Alaska. And the reason I chose that picture is because the way that middleware is implemented inside of Swift is always associated with a pipeline. A pipeline in, uh, in the world of Python servers, which is, where, um, which is how Swift is implemented, is a set of pieces of code that the request flows through and then goes, does its thing. The, 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 the pieces of middleware can intercept that uh, along the way, that request. It gets finally down to the application. And then the application generates a response, and the response comes back through in kind of the reverse way. And at any point, uh, a, a piece of middleware can be inserted, and it can intercept and change, if necessary, the request on the way in and the response on the way out, which means that you say, I want every 200 response that says good to actually be a 404. Well, you could do that by changing the data on the way out or something like that. Uh, if you want to rot 13 all the text, you could, you could do something like that. So uh, looking at some of the implementation of what this actually looks like, this is a, a, a snippet from the proxy server configuration file that kind of highlights these two major points. There's a section in, a, in the config file uh, that designates the pipeline. And here I've, I've cut out a couple of things, but I've, I've mentioned the catch errors, pipeline, the gate, uh, middleware, the, the gatekeeper, the, the proxy log logging. And then at the very, very end, we actually end with the proxy server. And then each of these different things, like catch errors, refers to a particular section in this config file. So in this case, the catch errors middleware is referring to this catch errors filter, in which case we're referring to a specific piece of Python code that is part of Swift and imported with as catch errors. And we have the same thing on the storage nodes. So here's a, an example from the object server uh, default sample configuration. In this case, we've got something much shorter, and we've only got two uh, pieces of middleware, uh, health check and recon. And here's the config files with their, with their default values. Uh, so again, in this case, the thing I wanted to point out here, let's take the health check example. So the health check, just like the previous example in the Python, we, we refer to the piece of code. But health check here um, also has another piece of configuration. It, it allows you to have a disable path, and it's just a file on disk. The health check functionality is, is kind of nice. It, if you refer to the uh, slash health check endpoint on a cluster and everything's OK, then it will return with OK, and that's it. It's, it's kind of good for uh, load balancing and seeing if a server's uh, alive. But if you have this file on disk, then it will, no matter what, always return with an error. It will return with a 503, which is kind of nice when you can drop this file on disk, say, in the midst of an upgrade. So if you reboot, it doesn't automatically start up the servers again and saying, hey, I'm ready. When you're actually not ready, you still have to do some other configuration after you reboot or something like that. So this, this is what the health check is done is doing and this is how it's configured and then we have another uh, another example here of recon its own independent uh, pieces of configuration and so when they're loaded this configuration is parsed and then passed into that middleware and they can do what's necessary for their configuration so where would you use this what kind of middlewares can you have so i have some examples of the, uh, things that have been done third party in the ecosystem and then a lot of things that have been done inside of swift itself if you've been to any of my talks over the past however many years we've been doing this OpenStack thing, you'll notice that I really like these guys. Um, I love the use case, mostly because I can tell my mom that anytime you go see a picture on Wikipedia, it comes from their own Swift cluster. And that's just really cool. So Wikipedia, in using Swift, has uh, added some pieces of middleware. One of the things that you can do on Wikipedia is you have different sizes of images, and they want to be able to generate those. Having hundreds of millions of images inside of Wikimedia, uh, Wikimedia Commons, you don't necessarily want to store every single arbitrary size possible thumbnail in there. That's just actually impossible. So instead, they have a piece of middleware which will intercept some, uh, I think it's query parameters, on, their, uh, on the path, on the URL. 
and they can on the fly check and see, oh, do I have one of those thumbnails at that arbitrary 200 by 200 pixels or whatever size generated? And if not, they can generate it on the fly and then return that back, and then they can cache that as necessary. So they have uh, added some uh, middleware for generating arbitrary thumbnails uh, for their images to their Swift clusters. So that's kind of one example. It's um, generating content from content that's in, the, in Swift and returning that. Another example, SoftLayer. It's bought by IBM, but they've, had, uh, they've been running public Swift clusters for a while. And one of the things that they do as a public cloud provider is they provide Swift, but they also have uh, some metadata searching and indexing on top of that. And they have, uh, the way they have, inter uh, they, have, they have glued those two pieces together with Swift is they've added some middleware that, has, uh, that, can, that can squirt out the right messages to the indexer and then intercept the, um, uh, any, any of the appropriate API requests to search on that data and send that to the indexer and so on and so forth. Which means that if you store data in Swift, they can index it on arbitrary metadata and then you can use their API to uh, to search on that, and that is done inside of middleware, which means that, again, that's, that's something that they can do. They can provide a value add on their thing that is not in conflict with just using the upstream code, and it's not in conflict with, say, IBM doing their, th I mean, uh, Wikipedia doing their thing, um, depending on what the use cases are. Rackspace is uh, obviously where, where Swift started, so they've been using Swift uh, quite, quite a while and have uh, some fairly large Swift clusters. Uh, a piece of middleware that they have that Rackspace has been using uh, is part of their specific value add, which is different than soft layers. Uh, and Rackspace is, uh, Cloud Files is tightly integrated with CDN providers. And so they needed a way to, the, the only way you can make content public inside of Rackspace Cloud Files is through their CDN server, uh, through the CDN partnership that they have. And so they needed a piece uh, to bridge the gap between those kind of public, publicly available things and the authenticated request inside of Cloud Files. And so they wrote this middleware called SOS, uh, Swift Origin Server, uh, that is available, and I believe it's used at HP as well. Uh, and so that was adding that functionality and a little bit of their CDN provisioning API um, for Cloud Files. Another one, uh, large user, and I believe they were giving a talk earlier today. Uh, NTT dat data has, uh, no? NTT? No data, just NTT. Cover up that DATA, okay, excuse me, sorry. NTT, point is, NTT is a very, very large company and I get confused on who works where. <laughs> Okay, the point is that uh, NTT has uh, um, also contributed some other things inside of the ecosystem. Um, and these are some things that some people are really interested in. Um, there have been some uh, contributions on how do you have a different API to Swift itself to translate it in. And so there's a uh, Swift 3 middleware that provides a subset of the S3 API so that you can use uh, S3 clients to talk to Swift. And that is done with a piece of middleware called Swift 3. And that's actually currently hosted on Stackforge. Um, there's been another one that I've seen in the past uh, that uh, I think came from IBM originally. And it was, uh, I'm not sure if it's currently being maintained or not, but it uh, supports a CDMI uh, plugin or a API implemented via middleware. So the point is you can actually forget just mutating the data. You can actually implement entirely new APIs on top of this. Um, there were a... There were two talks yesterday that were very, very interesting uh, about from IPM that were using middleware to run Docker containers on the Swift cluster, and so I figured that hit all the buzzwords, and it's actually kind of a kind of an interesting uh, an interesting uh, merging together of the compute and storage. We've seen some other things. I'll, I'll talk about the other guys in a second, um, but the point is adding completely outside the box functionality of uh, solving solving those analytics uh, problems of m uh, keeping the, the data and the, and the compute tied closely together. But again, being able to write middleware to do this. And then the last example I have of people in the ecosystem doing something is the company I work for, SwiftStack. Um, we've uh, kind of the most commonly used external middleware that we have uh, is auth integration um, to being able to integrate with LDAP and, and Active Directory without going through an external service. Um, so all of these different pieces here, um, auth to CDN integration to uh, mutating the data, uh, different APIs, all of that kind of things that have been over the last few years developed in the ecosystem already. Um, and most of those are open source, which is kind of cool. So let's 
flip it just a little bit, and I want to I want to uh, talk a little bit about the parts of Swift itself developed as part of the OpenStack um, code that are implemented as middleware. Middleware, uh, referring to Swift as pluggable and talking about, uh, ju just talking about middleware and saying that, well, middleware is the way it's pluggable is, is true, but it's not completely true. It's, it's not the complete story because middleware is a fantastic way to, uh, to structure code in such a way that you can say, this is an isolated piece of functionality that needs to mess with the request and we can, we can know how to do that. So this is a list of pieces of middleware inside of Swift that are actually implementing things that are seen from the client and that have to do with the API. So uh, two of them I want to talk about here, or a couple of, a couple of different categories. Uh, one is cross-domain. Uh, this one is a very simple piece of middleware. It implements uh, it, your, the endpoint uh, cross-domain.xml which for those of you who have done uh, media online know that that's uh, key for Flash uh, content online. That it allows you to do your browser uh, security model stuff. And so you can, with this piece of middleware, with Swift out of the box, have access. If you have turned on this cross-domain middleware, you can now access crossdomain.xml, and it will return the appropriate thing as you've configured it. So that's just a new endpoint uh, added to the Swift API that is implemented inside of Swift as middleware. And the other, uh, the other two together that I want to talk about are uh, lar uh, for large objects. There's two pieces of middleware, one called DLO and one called SLO for dynamic large objects and static large objects. So the way large objects work in Swift. So you take a, take a piece of data, like a, a file locally, and you throw it into Swift, and it's an object in Swift. Well, the object itself has a size limitation in Swift, but you can tie together different pieces, different objects into one logical large object um, that gives you essentially uh, unbounded size in Swift. So if you need to throw up your two terabyte object, you can do that by tying together smaller pieces and tying them together with a, a large object file. So the way the large objects are implemented is really interesting because it's all in middleware. So what happens is that the request comes in for, let's say, to read the large object. It will, the, the request will pass through, and then when the, res when, it, when the response starts coming back the other way, the middleware sees that it was responded and sees that, oh, that object was actually a manifest file. OK, I know how to deal with that. And then it can, it can parse the manifest file as appropriate. And then it can make other requests back into the system, generate new sub-requests into the system, and start refetching the data for the referred to files. Which means that then the, resp the response for the first file comes back, and that's what's sent back to the client. And as soon as that gets done, it can make that second request to the, to the cluster, and then start sending that, and, and thus concatenate the contents of the referred to files of the, of the manifest. So those, um, the large object support inside of Swift is done entirely in middleware which has a lot of advantages. Not only does it just move code out of the proxy server itself, and the proxy server really has to can be simplified in just worrying about coordinating uh, the responses for uh, storage nodes, but it also means that as you add new functionality, you can, you can start composing it, which means that um, you don't have to, you're generating these other sub-requests, and if you need to, um, uh, you need to make sure things are authenticated properly. Um, and if, what, well, no, here's an idea. What if you wanted to nest different kinds of manifest objects? Then that is kind of automatically taken care of. Or if you wanted to compose uh, functionality like, um, what was I just thinking of? The, the, the large objects and uh, versioned rights. So you don't, the, the code complexity inside of the proxy server, trying to figure out the orders of those and what, what order they could be, is, it, is the manifest referring to versioned files? And what happens if, if, the, if the manifest itself was versioned? And, and how does that work? But if you've got those composed as middlewares, then it, it becomes much simpler to reason about it and figure out how those things work. Now, there's another set of uh, middleware that's inside of Swift itself, which aren't directly seen as far as API goes but they're more seen from the operator side. And these are operator functionality pieces that are part of Swift itself um, that are incredibly useful, but you're not going to really see it writing a, a backup utility or something like that. Um, and these are kind of things that are, again, vitally important. Catch errors, I think, is one of the most important pieces of middleware because it, 
wraps up the entirety of thing to ensure two things. One, that the client will never actually see a traceback. So if, it, if there is some uh, uncaught exception, it will catch it right there. It catches the errors. It will appropriately log it so that the operators can deal with it. But then the uh, client will get a nice 500 message and uh, not have to. You don't leak details about your code um, to, to all the way to the public client. And, num and number two, catch errors also ensures that every res uh, response, every request all the way through, and then the response has a transaction ID on it. Um, so that that being the, the leftmost uh, uh, middleware in that pipeline it means it's the first thing there and the last thing it, it touches on the way out it means that it can just wrap everything up and put a nice neat bow on it. The other one is uh, Gatekeeper, which uh, basically ensures that um, there are certain pieces of middleware that need to be in certain order. For example, you want the auth to be in a certain uh, position relative to large object manifest to make sure that that works properly. And um, the Gatekeeper makes those things. You want to make sure, Gatekeeper makes sure that, say, catch errors is in the pipeline. Um, things like that. Um, if you wanted to take an example of a piece of middleware that exists inside of Swift that's very simple, and it's like, oh, that's a really good place to start, health check is perfect. It's, it's really simple. It's really easy to digest. It's much simpler than, say, the logging one. That one's, that one's tricky. Um, uh, and uh, it's a really great place to get started, just like, oh, I can do this. And in fact, how easy is it to do? Well, Christian, one of our core devs, gave a uh, talk last at the last summit in Atlanta, and on stage he wrote a piece of middleware, and you can watch the video of him doing that. And his his middleware that he wrote there was um, preview images, so it's kind of like the the resizing images, kind of like the Wikipedia model, um, but obviously a little more limited because um, he was just doing it from stage. Uh, but yeah, he was going through and saying, yeah, this is what you do first. This is how we configure it. This is how we install it. This is how we deploy it. Let's write a test for it, and then put it all together, and now we're running it, and it works. So it, it's, it's a very simple, it, to get the basic functionality, it's very, very simple to do, and you can, you can do it very quickly. So it's a great place for extensibility in the slide. So remember the basic design. We've got proxy servers, we've got storage nodes. Now here's the cool part. The cool part is you've got middleware in both proxy servers and in the storage nodes, which means that if you have something that needs to modify requests and responses, dealing with the API or some sort of wrapping up of that that has to do with the whole system, put it in the proxy server. If you need to do something that uh, is good to be done, distributed throughout the entire cluster, and is dealing with um, the persisting of data, well, then you can write middleware to do um, on the storage nodes themselves and, uh, and, and do it that way. So um, one, one example of this uh, would be that um, you need you need strong encryption on uh, on your data. One possible way to do this would be not the only, um, not always the best, but one possible way would say every time I get to a replica, so three times for every for every piece of data, um, I'll put some encryption middleware on the on the object storage node. Um, yes, it's doing it three times, but it's also going to be distributed throughout your entire cluster, and your and your proxy servers. Um, you probably have less proxy servers. There's obviously lots of caveats and things like that. So only do that if you're doing ROT13 encryption. OK, so that's middleware. So let's talk about the volume abstractions. Um, we have something inside of Swift. We have always had this inside of Swift. Uh, since, the, since the very beginning days, there's been a class called disk file. And by class, I mean the, like the Python class uh, called disk file. Disk file is how the object server specifically, the, the, the piece of Swift that's responsible for persisting data, object data to disk, talks to that particular storage volume. Normally a storage volume is equated one-to-one uh, -one with a hard drive. But when you start talking about disk files, that's when it gets a little bit fuzzy. So showed you that, uh, des that design flow. So let's zoom in just on that storage node. The storage node is talking to the hard drives, and it's a little bit different than um, than uh, than this, because actually you've got that disk file right there. So the store, the object server has has a disk file instance, which is what you, it uses to talk to the individual hard drives. Now, the simplest way to to think about uh, the volume abstraction inside of Swift and being able to say that this is this is a point of extensibility is. You can buy a hard drive from any company you want, and that shows that Swift is pluggable as far as the hard drives go, um, which is completely true. And is, it is, in fact, a way that a lot of people 
are able to customize things because Swift expects to talk to a storage volume and oftentimes it's a local file system there. Um, and the disk file in reality is just speaking POSIX to a, what it assumes is a local XFS volume. Now, what happens if you change that? Instead of just saying, I'm going to buy HGST instead of Seagate, or Seagate instead of HGST, let's, let's add some more functionality there. So this abstraction, can you can write your own abstraction that is responsible for um, talking to that storage volume. And that's where some very interesting things come into play. And these are people I know of in the community already who have been using this level of abstraction um, within Swift already existing. So I mean, I, I know there's going to be more people in the future, but even just starting today. Zero VM is interesting because in addition to, uh, I, I mentioned the, the IBM Docker middleware sort of things. Zero, Zero VM has some middleware that they're using for their, uh, their uh, implementation of moving compute to storage, uh, but they're also using um, disk files to provide that sandboxing of, of the compute with uh, uh, compute process um, to, to execute right next to the storage. Um, so that's one kind of way that they're doing that. Um, Seagate is interesting uh, because it is a completely not POSIX sort of thing. Um, they have that new storage platform called uh, Kinetic, and uh, it doesn't speak POSIX. It's a, it's a key value API that's on the other side of a network um, rather than a locally attached thing that has a file system on it. So there's a disk file uh, implementation uh, that SwiftStack has written that is... Um, that speaks that kinetic protocol, so you can run Swift on top of kinetic drives. Um, HP has been using something that is um, uh, integrated with um, with their store once line, I believe. Um, something that they've been they've been playing with uh, uh, to basically looking at that that a little more traditional but um, uh, kind of integrated hardware software product. Um, and they can now run, uh, they, can, they can use Swift with that to talk to those, uh, those kind of um, more traditional storage systems. And then there are other storage systems out there who have looked at this and, uh, and have said, we want to be able to um, have the Swift API because OpenStack is awesome, and we want to be able to talk to our own particular storage system. Now remember, Swift does not provision storage systems. You're not going to go ask, make an API call to Swift to get a Scality or Ceph or Gluster cluster. Um, what, you, what you can do with the implementations that these guys have been working on um, through various states of, of readiness is to uh, say, I'm running Swift, and I'm running actually Swift code, the, the code that is part of, of the OpenStack governance model. I'll come back to that. Um, and I will be able to use that to talk to this other system. So those are the kind of things that are very interesting. And it's, it's not entirely surprising that this has happened in the ecosystem, uh, but it, I have to admit, it's not something I, com I completely expected when we first started working on this sort of thing, because in my mind, you know, Swift is always designed for uh, commoditizing the hardware and abstracting that away from the data that stores so the, they, can, they can be swapped out and you can, you can have this nice, durable, scalable system. What's really interesting and what's really exciting is seeing how much is happening in the community that are taking it above and beyond that uh, places we didn't even really know um, that, it, that it would be going. And it's, it's been really exciting to see that sort of thing. One of the things along those lines that uh, I'm not aware of any work today on, but something I do want to, with an eye to the future, look at is figuring out how to have, for example, some uh, flash-optimized disk files. So the object server doesn't need to be concerned about what the data looks like or, or how that is actually laid down on disk. But yeah, the flash has different characteristics than uh, spinning media, and most people use spinning media for Swift because it's cheaper than Flash. So what if we could do something that gives you, especially now that we have storage policies in Swift, it allows you to say this kind of data is going to be here, and this kind of, kind of data is going to be here, um, and, and separating hardware. What if we said we have a storage policy that's Flash-based, and that gives us a certain SLA and cost model and things like that. Let's have a disk file that is optimized for that. I think that would be kind of cool. Um, again, I think this is something that will be uh, talking about uh, next year in the community, uh, kind of after erasure codes are done. So the final thing I want to talk about here, and I think we looks like we're going to have plenty of time for questions. Uh, the final thing uh, I want to talk about here is uh, another topic that's been kind of big in OpenStack recently, and it's uh, this thing that the board's been working on called DevCore. Um, without going into a lot of backstory or history on this, basically the point is to within 
OpenStack, let's, how do we designate extensibility within that? So with that kind of picture on things, um, yeah, there's a lot of trademark and, and concerns and, and other, other issues that are tied up in it. But basically, if you're saying you're using OpenStack, what are, what are you saying you're using? And then that also is a very strong implication, if, not, if it is not explicit, to say that, oh, yeah, here's the places where you can extend things. So while I'm going to put this next, uh, with the words up on stage, and they're completely not official at all. This is an ongoing process. But kind of uh, the latest uh, iteration of what we've been working on uh, through that specifically with Swift is, yeah, you, if it's going to be called Swift, if it's going to be the Swift definition, rumor, not, a, not official, um, not finalized at all. It's basically you're going to use the proxies and the storage nodes, and you're going to be able to add your own middleware, and you're going to be able to implement your own disk file and use that if you want to. And if that's kind of the general rule. Now, again, I'm, I know I'm putting this on stage and it's recording for posterity and all that kind of thing, but uh, this is an ongoing process. It's one of the great things about OpenStack is working together in the community. So this is basically the thing. This is uh, the areas of extensibility that we have that are um, that mean that we can both continue to be a really awesome implementation of object storage that provides scale and durability and high availability and massive concurrency and that sort of thing. That, you know. um, so those, those awesome things, great for applications, but we also know that we can integrate with uh, both forward-looking things, but also we can uh, provide a really great bridge for people who need to have a, have a way to migrate off of more traditional things. Um, so unfortunately, we can't just change the world and start all over from, from scratch. We have to look to the past, build a bridge from there so we can get to the future. And that's these, these areas of, ex uh, of extensibility inside of Swift, with the middleware, with the, uh, with the disk file uh, volume abstraction, are where we can do that and how we can do that. Um, so that being said, you've got this nice little composable set of things that you can put together. And so the idea is, that's great. You've now, you've got Swift as a modular extensible object storage system. So the question then to you is, what are you going to build? What questions do you have? <laughs> Any, I think we've got a little bit of time. What kind of questions do you have? Just a little bit, five minutes. Awesome. Well, it is 5.52 uh, on the last day of the conference. Design Summit stuff is tomorrow. One thing I do want to specifically point out, um, if you'd like some more information about running Swift and, and using it and playing around with it, understanding how it works, how you actually deploy it, uh, there's a workshop tomorrow in the Hyatt Hotel uh, put on by SwiftStack that is a really great overview of a lot of technical details about that. You have a question right there. I'm so sorry. This lights are right in my eyes. <laughs> hey, John. I'm Lee Calco from Cisco. Mm -hmm. um, new to Swift, uh, but was intrigued by your description of, or by the kind of on-stage brainstorming you were doing around um, new use cases for, I guess, uh, an SSD, uh, a solid-state specific disk file. Sure. Did you have specific use cases, uh, you know, in, in mind for how it would behave, how disk file would speak to solid-state differently? So the basic idea is that you've got different, if you, even if you look at where flash and, ro and rotating media are today, um, the read and write characteristics are very different, just as far as like the physical durability. You can only read and write a certain time. You overwrite a certain amount of time on, this, uh, and the, and on the flash and the way that the, um, uh, everything is grouped. It's not sectors and spindles and things like that. It's more of a direct access and blocks of stuff um, in the flash. And I'll, I'll be completely honest. I'm, I'm I don't have a deep expertise in, in that, that world. Um, so even looking there, and then looking forward on some other things that people are talking about, about the shingle magnetic recording drives, which is completely different than the way Flash would done. And then looking at the trends of stuff, you've got, uh, yes, drives are getting, uh, spinning drives are getting cheaper and bigger, but Flash is getting much cheaper quickly. Um, at some point, looking to the future, I want to be ready when they're I've already had deployers come to me and say, I want to not have any moving parts in my data center. That includes spindles. Everything they're doing, you know, the density and the power savings you can get on, on certain things today, and especially looking a few years down the road. Basically, I want to be ready for that. And so I don't know exactly what it is. I want to work with Flash vendors and uh, people who are into, uh, working in the OpenStack community to say, this is awesome. So the use cases, 
in my mind, I'm sure will be, well, are, are very much similar to what we're doing now, except you're going to get different characteristics, different, I mean, it, it's going to look a little different. It's going to behave a little differently. I don't know exactly what those are going to be, but it's, it is the future, so let's get out of the way of the train and, and ride it instead of getting smashed by it. Yes? Is there any community place to discover out-of-tree middleware? Not really, unfortunately. So, I, well, okay. Yes. There, there is a place inside of the, the developer documentation that uh, we keep track of like just associated projects. And we, we have um, references to a lot of other projects there. Uh, you can get to that at swift.openstack.org. Um, if that needs to be updated, the problem is it's, it's updated with a code batch. So you're free to do that. It's very simple to do. It's, it's very simple format. Or just tell us, and somebody will do it. And it's very fast to do. But it does require that. Um, there is also some things like the Swift 3 middleware that is done with inside of, managed inside of StackForge. Um, that's not a great fit for everybody. Um, so there might be some stuff there. And other than that, my, my experience thus far is that most people who are doing this sort of thing are rather proud of it and like to talk about it a lot. So <laughs> keep a, a Twitter search running for OpenStack Swift, and yeah, you'll find it. Uh, any other questions? So workshop tomorrow in the Hyatt. Um, and uh, then the design, um, the, the design summit is ongoing. Our Swift design sessions are tomorrow, uh, starting around noon uh, for, the, for the contributors. Uh, and then we've got kind of a, a morning on Friday for that. And other than that, thank you very much for coming. And I'll be around for briefly for any questions.